Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Try listening to them on audio, featuring sound effects and music directly from the movies. Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. With stories from your favorite Star Wars movies, television shows, and comics, you'll have plenty to keep you entertained. Start listening now wherever audiobooks are sold. This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to Coffee with Kenobi. We are your spoiler-free place for Star Wars discussion, analysis, and rhetoric. I am your host, Dan Z, joined today by the one and only Tom Gross. Well, hello, everybody. It's good to be here, as always. Not great. Good. It's good. It's good. It is good. good. Why not great? (laughs) I don't know. I guess maybe I need to fill up my coffee cup. You know what? I'm glad you brought that up. This is actually probably the earliest we've ever recorded coffee with Kenobi. It is 8 a.m. here at the IdeaCon conference. And uh, it's kind of cool. Like, we actually need, oh, I don't know if need is the right word, but we actually are having coffee while we record coffee with Kenobi. Yeah, maybe that's why I can't push out the great. Maybe by the end of the show, I will feel and be great. Like Tony the Tiger, great. Yes. Well, speaking of Tony the Tiger, great, we are going to review for you today A Distant Echo. That is the second episode in Season 7 of Star Wars The Clone Wars. Starts out with, well, first of all, overall thoughts on the episode before we dive in? It, it led me right where I thought I was going to go. Um, you know, I thought episode one was a great setup for the series. Um, and, uh, and this one just attaches right to it with a rather, oh, how does the ending make you feel? Um, Cl- you mean this one or the one from this season one, one? This one. Uh, like a, kind of a punch to the gut, really. Yeah. Yeah. So... So, you know, initial reaction, I was really pleased with it. All right, very good. I, uh, do you have a letter grade? I'm going to stick with B-plus on this one. Maybe you'll change my mind as we talk, or maybe I'll change my own mind. <laughs> Difficult to see the future is. Uh, I, I liked it. I thought it was very, very cool to see Anakin, the interplay with Anakin and Padme, the brief stuff we got with Obi-Wan. Uh, I don't know that this took as many leaps in the development of the clones as the first episode, The Bad Batch, did. But there really wasn't a, a reason narratively to do that. Oh, I saw a little bit of growth. We'll talk, that, talk okay. about that on the way. And I also appreciated the little uh, humor with Captain Rex, yeah, well, which was, is unexpected. Right, right. I, I think I'd probably give this one a B-plus or a B. And it's pretty much a straight action thing with a, with a wonderful little ending and a little climax. But it starts out with... The search for truth begins with belief. And I really like this because no one really believed that Echo was alive, except for Rex. He just had this feeling in his gut. He believed in it, and he searched for what was actually real when he wanted to hold on to. And I think that's a really nice metaphor. Yes. Um, I think about in episode one, that, that moment when he's sitting on the bunk, looking at the photo of Heavy and Echo, and I think Fives was in that picture, and he's, he's, weigh, he's weighing the, the loss of the war, and he does have that gut feeling, and he didn't share it with the Jedi, but he says something to Captain Cody, or I'm sorry, Commander Cody, and here we are. We're on, we're on the ship heading to Skeko Minor in search of the truth. Um, and Rex, you're right, Rex had that, that gut feeling, and it is in this episode that we discover, even though Hunter continues to question his that gut feeling, um, and so th- I think that that all uh, that all builds up really nicely. Absolutely. So uh, we'll just sort of look at the beginning as far as they've got a bit of a new plan. Hunter wants to help out. Um, he says, even if it's only to say, "I told you so," but he doesn't really have a wink or a smile. But that is certainly the intent. And I'm going to miss Hunter when he's not in these because I really like sort of how he is tough and a little on the outskirts of what would normally happen, but he's still rational in his own kind of bad batch way. I kind of think when, I don't kind of think, I know when we were watching this, I was a little surprised that we were going to get the bad batch continued in this story. I kind of thought they were a one and done. And uh, and I'm so glad that they came back because they showed us 
they showed us a lot more in this about their strategy. You know, we got their stra- their straightforward, in-the-face strategy in, in episode one, and we got a little bit different uh, view of them um, in this one. We had we still continue to have, you know, the knife fight with, you know, where Hunter attacks the, 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 the droids, the um, battle droids, or the modified battle droids in this right. one with his knife, but they, they, uh, they used a, another tactic that I thought was really cool. Do you want me to go into that now, or you want to yeah, wait until yeah, we get you, to that? No, go part? ahead. Go ahead. So uh, in this, they, they, met, they land on Skeko Minor, and they discover that uh, there is an alien race that lives there, or maybe they're the aliens, and there's a race that lives there of um, this, I don't know, if they fly on these reptilian creatures, and they are skinny, tall creatures that have a very unique language and I love the way their voices sound kind of echoey and deep um, but echoey ooh huh. thanks for catching that interesting in- that is interesting um, okay wait brain's coming back I, I just flew around the, the, the circle there and now I'm coming back um, Anakin gets uh Kidnapped, I suppose, by one of the birds. The, the birds attack, and they grab Anakin, and they fly off with him. So this is the part where I I really appreciated seeing Bad Batch in this episode because as they're flying, as the creature is flying away with um, Anakin uh, by its claws, Tech drops his visor, gives the coordinates, distance, all that kind of information. And uh, Crosshair steps up and says, leave this to me. He reattaches some sort of new attachment to his rifle. And this is the part I loved. Sets the rifle on Tech's shoulder for support and fires a grappling hook. The grappling hook attaches to the bird. And then Tech, or uh, sorry, Crosshair hands the end of the grappling hook to Hunter. And Hunter takes off flying. It was a moment of like, what, six, seven seconds? Yeah. But it was so slick and seamless, and it just makes you realize that while while you've got Wrecker and Hunter and Crosshair that are all the bad batch, they are as slick and uh, and maneuvering as any of the clones are. Yeah, and it's and it's also a nice example of the teamwork and the the trust they have in each other. Speaking of trust, let's go to the beginning of this thing where. Anakin, uh, they're making a plan, and Anakin looks at Rex and goes, "Well, what about?" We have that thing, and Rex isn't catching on right away. And he goes, and he goes, we don't need to, we can miss that, or we don't need to go to that. And he goes, yes, we do. But for some reason, the way that Matt Lanter says that, they're the animated Anakin's face. So there's no annoyance. It's more like, come on, dude. I got to go see my wife. Yeah. And just the way that they uh, executed that was Absolute gold. I mean, it was it was cool to see that much acting in that sequence through an animated format. Yeah, and I, I thought that was great too. And I, I I've noticed this about we, uh, on the last episode that we talked about um, the Bad Batch episode one. We talked about the the new layer, the new texture to the animation and the production value of this. And I've I've really noticed that here in this this episode, so much closer um, match to emotions in the face. Uh, faces of the characters to the tone of the actors and it's it's just it's almost seamless in fact the only reason i say it's not seamless is because the minute i say that we'll catch something that doesn't seem right but right now it is it is perfect and so they they head to the barracks and uh this is where i i i my brain just was not with it yet and i remember you said you know what he's going to do right and I was, I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure. I thought it was going to be like a some sort of a meetup with Ahsoka I did, to plan okay. something. I did too. That's where I, that's where my brain went too. So I'm glad you said that um, because it wasn't Ahsoka. No, it was this great, this wonderful moment with Padme that I don't know that people were expecting. And this is an example of how episodes two and part of three could have been, as far as the dialogue between the two, where it could have been playful. And affectionate and charming. Like, I thought it was absolutely spot on the way that Anakin and Padme interacted. And that, that is, a, again, I'm repeating myself, but it's an example of how things could be and should be and why there is that, that profound love and respect for one another. At least at this point. Of course, things go south pretty soon in, in the timeline, but right now this is sort of a, you know, he is, they are playing off of each other's strengths. The writing and the dialogue here is... It's fantastic, and it's you hit the nail on the head with that. It, 
it definitely shows that relationship that maybe we did not get full the full feeling of in the films. I wrote down that it's clear here that Padme demonstrates that she knows and understands Anakin's struggles uh, with the Jedi, with what his place in the world, um, even with his love for her. And, uh, and, and she demonstrates that here through the dialogue because he, he doubts himself and he questions himself and, and, uh, and, and she gives the advice that he needs to hear there. And again, the, between the animation and the acting, uh, the voice acting here, it, 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 is, it is a charming moment. Plus, everything she is to, he is saying about Rex could have very well be said about himself, which is so cool. And she catches up on that, and she even says, you know, he's always there for you. You need to be there for him. And I thought that was a great little, uh, little hey, man, do you see what's going on here? This, is, this could easily be related to you. Very eye-opening. Yeah. Huh. Speaking of eye-opening, you want to yeah. talk about the part that made you laugh? Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad you uh, brought this up because I thought this was great. It was so out of, I don't want to say out of character for Rex, but he's a soldier. He's Captain Rex. And so Captain Rex has to play sort of the, the straight man in this. And so when Anakin goes into the barracks to do the hollow call with uh, Padme, it's Rex's duty to stand outside and make sure nobody comes. But then, of course, who comes walking across the, uh, the courtyard there but Obi-Wan Kenobi? And I don't know if you caught, the music gets a little light. There's sort of a uh, circus, I don't want to say circusy feel. I didn't write down what, what it sounded like to me, but it's, it's, it's a, a lighter feel to the music as, Anna, as uh, Obi-Wan approaches. And you know that you just expect that Captain Rex, because he's, he follows orders and he's not going to lie, he can't. And so he really, you know that this is going to be comical because he's going to try to stutter and stammer his way and, ex- and try to keep Obi-Wan out of the barracks. And so he knocks, he knocks on the door to let Anakin know that Obi-Wan is coming and he's this and that and he's trying to um, stall Obi-Wan. Well, Anakin comes out just in time to save Rex, save face for Rex and um, hands, it, hands the helmet to him, and Obi-Wan tries to address the, the, you know, the, the Jedi Council is not you know, approving of this, but he says the Jedi Council, and Anakin continues with, thinks that this is a great idea. And then out of frustration as Anakin and Rex are walking, we get the close-up of Anakin and Rex facing us with Obi-Wan in the background, and Obi-Wan says, be sure to tell Padme I said hello. And <laughs> Captain Rex's eyes like bulge out of his head, like oh, oh, oh. we even rewound that. <laughs> yes, it was. It's just it was such a charming moment, and I, I love it because it's it's an unexpected expression from Captain Rex. So, and I, I should know this, but does Obi Wan know about Padme and Anakin? I mean, I know. I think in in Revenge of the Sith, there's a moment where you kind of get this sense, but this might be the first time chronologically that the viewer is privy to that information. Can you think of any other examples? I do not believe so. I'm trying to think. Because Anakin makes this pretty serious long look back at Obi-Wan um, with just this kind of like, I don't know how to, grit, determination, um, uh, frustration, anxiety. I don't know. It's, I don't know if there is an emotion to describe it, but... You can definitely tell that it, it, it kind of hits him like, he knows. He knows. Yeah. And I think the way... But uh, he's also not throwing him under the bus. Correct. And he's, and he's, he's the one who's very much adheres to the, to the Jedi Doctrine. I mean, he doesn't break the mold like Qui-Gon did. But he certainly is inclined to be a little bit more of a maverick type when it comes to Anakin. Because he's got a soft spot for Anakin. He is attached to Anakin. Hmm. And that's forbidden. Right. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, if this is the first uh, hint that we have that Obi-Wan knows, then I, I think the, the manner in which this was communicated through that playful music and this uh, charade between Rex and Obi-Wan, it lets us know that, and we know already, that Anakin's not going to throw him under the bus or, or hold his feet to the fire on this relationship that he has with Padme. Um, I believe in some ways Anakin or Obi-Wan understands. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So that, that's, I think that's a little noteworthy. It's something to kind of 
keep track of. Then we go down to um, Skako Minor, and we we meet the Poltics. Those are the the uh, alien species that you referred to earlier. They uh, are yes, they're referred to as primitive people on Skako Minor. But I'm fascinated by that. They're, you know, they're an indigenous people, and they have you know a different way of doing things. But that's because. They're on a different place, so it, it may be different for Anakin or the clones, but it's not different for them. Talk about the idea of them being primitive people. Well, you know, the first thing I thought of when 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 they were faced with the, what what is the name? The Poltex Poltix. P o I wrote down P o u l t i x. Poltix is um, here's another instance of a natural race uh, that the Jedi are being faced with. Um, and I go back to you know I go back to rebels and Ezra's connection to the to nature and and all of that and so I wondered if we would have any play there and I think it's interesting that that uh, Anakin is the one that's picked up by the Poltic uh, primitive bird, mm-hmm. um, but when they do when they do eventually get to um, translating with them, you know the first thing that they say is we don't want your war. Here on this planet, on this planet, and I think that goes back to that you know how invasive the separatists and then eventually the empire becomes to the galaxy is you have peaceful creatures, you have peaceful um, populations on these planets that the war intrudes upon, and the Jedi get wrapped up in that, um, and uh, and so to call them primitives, yeah, I mean I, I understand that, but really. When you when you look at their language and this the structure the apparent the, you know the brief structure we see of their of their community uh, primitive only only to the eyes of of those from a, you know a larger society right and I and I think and I do think it's like a, a a positive thing and I do think it's great how Star Wars celebrates differences in culture and race and tradition um, and in a very in an interesting way because you know you mentioned the language I love the part where tech translates you know there's no dumbing down of the language or the culture because it's different than the one that you're used to it's more like we need to celebrate this to understand these people we need to speak their language tech is able to do that through technology mm-hmm. uh, to, to decipher something which of course I mean what, a, what an incredible invention that would be but I found it really really cool and again a celebration of difference, yeah, those are great points, and I just want to point out from uh, from the from when we talked about the first episode. Remember, we talked about our favorites in in the Bad Batch. Yeah, uh, I, I'm just continued to be pleased with my decision of mentioning tech because here's an example where tech uses technology yeah. to bridge a gap and to create peace and uh, understanding through his use of uh, the translator that he has in his visor, which, by the way. Uh, cinematography wise I loved when he drops the visor down and we get the point of view of the tech and-, and we can see the two languages coming uh, out right in front of our eyes and I think that is so cool and then, then the, the part that I found really to be amusing and show the differences in culture is when the, um, the politics leader that they're talking to we see him through again text point of view. He walks up and like looks into the visor. You know, did you did you catch that? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I just thought that was that was so neat. And it, as a viewer of the show, I thought that was really cool, and I appreciated that point of view. Again, the notion of using technology to bridge gaps in culture and to understand a different culture is a pretty um, groundbreaking idea that I think people are trying to do more and more that are on the innovative side of things and. I applaud Lucasfilm for approaching this uh, from this style. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books but can't find the time? Try listening to them on audio. Featuring sound effects, top-notch narrators, and music directly from the movies... Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. From Rey, Finn, and Kylo Ren to Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, you'll recognize all of your favorite characters from the Star Wars galaxy. Listen to the newest books in the Star Wars universe, like The Rise of Skywalker Expanded Edition by Rey Carson, 
featuring new content you didn't see in theaters. Looking for something your kids can listen to? Try Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, a junior novel by Michael Koji. With Star Wars audiobooks, you'll have plenty of Star Wars listening to keep you entertained. Available wherever audiobooks are sold. Rise of the Resistance is now open on both coasts, Walt Disney World and Disneyland, so you need to consider booking that incredible vacation, and I can think of no better place to recommend than MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. It is what my family uses, and it is what Coffee with Kenobi uses. They are our travel partner, and we absolutely love working with Becky Mankin and the team at MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. They are the best. I trust them absolutely in planning these vacations. Their advice helps me maximize my vacation time and dollar, and it will you as well. Their no cost, no obligation quote when you use the service is wonderful, and they will also proactively adjust the booking if the rate goes down. Plus, they will help you plan as much or as little as possible. So if you like and you feel really comfortable about Disney World and Disneyland and the cruise lines, and you just want some little extra help along the way, that's fine. Or if you are new to this or not as comfortable planning it out because you don't want to miss anything, then MEI and Mouse Fan Travel is the absolute place for you to go. And trust me, I would not recommend Becky Mankin and MEI and Mouse Fan Travel if I didn't use the service, if I didn't love what they do and what they are standing for, and they really do want to help you have the best vacation possible. Go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel and sign up for a free, no obligation quote. You'll have the best vacation possible and help out Coffee with Kenobi in the process. So is there anything you want to say about before we get to the actual final battle sequence? I do. There's uh, there's a moment, and this is re- in regards, I'm going back to the Bad Batch because I think that I, I'm just fascinated by this this group and how they are their interplay with uh, the, quote, what they term regs uh, works. Um, The question is posed to, uh, I believe it's Hunter, and I don't recall who says it, but the question is, who do you report to? And Hunter turns and And says... Does Rex asks that to Hunter? To Hunter, yes, it's Rex. And uh, Hunter turns and says... Good question. And I just, I found that to be a bit fascinating because I I had the same question on my mind, is where does the Bad Batch fit in the grand scheme of the war? Who who tasks them with go do this or go do that? Is it it a Jedi? Is it an, I mean, is it Commander Cody? Commander Cody is absent from this uh, episode. Of course, he was injured. Yeah, yeah, he was injured. But we we see we don't see Commander Cody at all in this episode. So it's inter- My I guess what I what I found to be interesting is not even Hunter really knows who they report to, and I feel like this demonstrates a certain independence in the Bad Batch that the rest of the clones don't have. Ties in a little bit when they get they do have another tussle up on the rock when the Poltics take them to, sh- to point out where the Separatist uh, base is, and. Um, and I don't remember what necessarily causes. It's, it's a comment by Crosshair regarding letting Echo go and Captain Rex charges and Oh, because he basically says he's already dead and, and, he, and basically what does it matter? He's just a reg. Okay, yes, that's right. And Rex shoves him, Wrecker picks him up, Anakin uh, gets involved. Then Anakin has a little talk with Rex, um, basically saying... Look, if he's there, then then this is the right thing, and and you know it's going to be, you know, you will be satisfied, but just be ready that we may not have a satisfying end to this. Well, and I, I did write down. I like that uh, Anakin here is legitimately a, a Jedi. He's actually a peacekeeper. He Great doesn't use point. violence. He doesn't like use the force to separate them or or get all high and mighty. And I'm a Jedi. He just says, "Hey," he talks to his friend like a like a brother. Yeah, he says, "Hey, you need to come on. You got to stop this stuff." Uh, I do want to talk about the notion that um, the fact that he calls Echo, who might be dead, a reg is pretty cold-hearted, uh-huh. and it does show a bit of of internal racism amongst the clones, which I don't think was really present in the Bad Batch episode. But it does show a little bit of uh, uh, discrimination there because you're not uh, one of us; you're just regular. And maybe he's been discriminating against because he's part of the Bad Batch. He's a, you know, what is it? What do they say? They're like a, a favorable mutation, and maybe that was a problem for him at times growing up. Who knows? Yeah, that's and that's what I was going to suggest that maybe he's faced so much 
um, they have faced so much discrimination because they are the, quote, bad batch. They're the, the experiments gone wrong, I suppose, uh, is, is what, what is implied. And so, yeah, and so he recognizes the difference. And because they are, the, because the, the regular clones, the regs, are in their eyes a little weaker because they don't have these special abilities, you see that uh, he's pointing out that difference there. So pretty fascinating, and so they, they come to their senses, they get back to business, and then we actually get into the, to the what is it, like? it's not as, it's like basically a base. Yeah, a, a yeah. techno union base, oh, yeah. Wat Tambor is Wat there. Wat Tambor is there, yeah. Um, I wanted to, I'm sorry, to, yeah, to step no, back, ahead, I, I saw, I'm seeing another note that I wanted to point Please. out regarding yeah. the Bad Batch. We also discover that Hunter has a military rank and he's referred to that way twice, once by Anakin and once by, I believe it's Tech, might be Crosshair, um, that, that Hunter holds the rank of sergeant. And so there is some sort of, you know, earlier, who do you report to? Uh, good question. But we learn that he does have a rank of sergeant. So anyway, for what that's, for what that's worth. But yes, they, uh, they end up at the Techno Union base where um, tech, and, and an interesting aspect of that um, tracking, because tech is tracking the signal being sent out by what they believe to be Echo, and when they get to the base, they discover that they, can, they, they frequently lose touch with Echo's signal. And uh, they, find that, they find that curious, um, and then tech discovers that perhaps it's not a consistent signal right that that echo is sending it out and then it stops and they lose it for a bit and then there's another signal sent out and uh and so is that kind of like an echo right i mean really yeah yeah like when you yeah when you holler into the canyon and you get the one and it stops and another stops and another stops good point boy i love i love all the uh this symbolism that you're pulling out is that symbolism that yeah. you're pulling yeah. out there yeah, yeah. That's great. Another observation that we made regarding this, and before we talk about the actual scene, is there are battle droids here. They sound like, you close your eyes, they sound like battle droids, but the Techno Union robots do not look like battle droids. No, they, I know, and I don't know that we've ever seen anything like that before either. And I'm hoping that, I know, I know for the first episode, eventually StarWars.com had a thing where they give us kind of background on the episode. So I hope we get that for this because I'd like to know what they are. Yeah. Real quick, uh, before we go to the final final battle stuff, um, I did a poll on Coffee with Kenobi's Twitter account. Oh, who's your favorite the Clone Wars Bad Batch clone and why? It's so of course Hunter, Wrecker, Crosshair, and Tech. So guess who I voted for? I know who you voted for. Am I the only one? No. Uh, uh, so do you want to know who wins? Who I is do. Winning. It's who, not over yet. I, can I guess? Yeah, I'm going to guess Hunter is in the lead. He is, but it's not by as big of a margin as you Ooh, might think. Really? Okay. So, in last place is Crosshair with 11.4. Now, he doesn't come across as a likable, very He's super skilled, cool, yeah. Very skilled, very talented, but his person, he has a low charisma. Uh, yeah, very good. <laughs> Wrecker is second with 13.6. Oh, okay. I would guess that people like, I didn't ask my son who his favorite was, but I would guess he would say Wrecker because he's more like the Hulk because he's strong. Yeah, and he makes those, you know, like, yeah, bring on more, yeah. and things like that. Yeah, he's, he's likable. He is. So that's 13.6. But then we jump up quite a bit. Tech is 31.8. <gasps> really? Yeah. What, My do you, what do you think? There are some reasons here I'll, I'll read to you. But, and then Hunter comes in at 43.2. All right. Yeah, so the, the reasons that, that people Are you put, leaving that poll open for a while? I am. I am. All right. My tech There's friends get out left. there and, and vote for my guy. I, I just I really like tech. I, I like his sensibility. I like that he feeds the group information. And I love I love again. I, I know we just talked about this, but I love that he he bridged that cultural gap with technology. That's well, so cool. Our friend Emma uh, from the the great blog Hello oh, yeah. from Hoth. She writes, I love tech. Oh yes, Emma. She's, I knew I could count on you. Well, she says, <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. She says his glasses are in. On point, and I love how he spews random and useless information like he's super smart, but no one cares. That's how I feel talking about history so much. <laughs> Hunter is a close second, though, mysterious and moody with the most amazing hair. He does have nice hair. Uh, well, we mentioned how he's got that Rambo 80s look yeah. going with yeah. the headband and all that. Yeah, huh. 
I guess so, I, I need to pay attention to more fashionable things like well, that come sometimes. On. Yeah. So that's good. Thanks, Eva, for weighing in on that. And then Sir Cal loves TROS, which, of course, is the rise of Skywalker, says, Crosshair, I like the quiet and sarcastic types. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, he would be definitely your guy. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, Jarlax the Rogue says, Hunter is the hashtag hot clone. Ooh. So look at that. So we've right. got three people who waited on the act. Because I put in the, the poll to say who's your favorite and why. So if you want to weigh in on this so far, um, you've heard the breakdown in the voting. So weigh in, put the reasons why in the comments, and we will certainly discuss it on a future show. Absolutely. That, I, I really like that. I love getting feedback like that. Me too. You have something you were going to say? No? Um, no. So at the end of this, we, we break in. There's those battle droids that are uh, not your typical battle droids. Um, they're a lot less mobile, and they're a lot less anthropomorphized. They're more just like actual robots. Yeah, they've got more structure to them. Um, yeah. I did notice, I believe that they have dual weapons, though, which might make them a bit more dangerous. Um, but the, uh, the, the com- combination of the clone uh, strike force and along with the Bad Batch, uh, they really handle them just fine. And it was, it was another example, and this, what I really liked about this one is they set their differences aside, they have a common goal now, and uh, and Hunter says before before sending um, Rex in, he says, "I hope you, I hope you find what you came looking for," which I don't know. I saw that as a as a peace making gesture um, through words, and then the battle ensued, and we saw more of the knife fighting from Hunter, which is spectacular, a little violent, but but spectacular, and uh, and you see. Oh, what? yes, it was Crosshair who slides across the floor and just picks off these droids as he's sliding and pops right up and just blasts one right <laughs> point blank. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a beautiful battle. It was battle. very cool, yeah. It was a beautiful battle with showing both the skills of, um, and I'm, I'm, I promise I will not use this term outside of this conversation, but showing the collaboration and the working together of the regs and the Bad Batch. No, that's true. No, that's true. Yeah, I mean, in that term, regs, I think, is a really important term that you could really spend a lot of time dissecting. Yeah. But, it, but it's a very sort of an in, an in culture word, right? Um, yeah. That can set someone off, or it could be a term of endearment from one to another, from one, from one mm-hmm. person to another. So it's very interesting, very uh, interesting parallels there. And this moment, this, this action sequence is really a nice sample of how far they've come with the animation and the, the animatics and how they are able to blend things together. There's some great stuff with Anakin. It's great to see him in action again. Yes. And when we were watching this last night, I started thinking about the fact that wow, these are the last Skywalker stories. I mean, The Rise of Skywalker isn't the last one. It's this. Because we're going to have oh. Anakin in it. And that yeah. kind of made it even more painful knowing that it's going to be over very, very soon. It kind of hits you, doesn't it? Yeah, I, that was not something that I thought of last night while we were watching. But but you're absolutely right. These are the final stories of of uh, Skywalker and and Anakin at that. Um, I I really and, um, again continue to be amazed by how much the Clone Wars animated series made me love Anakin Skywalker. I mean, love him. That's how that's that's what it did for me for Obi Wan Kenobi. Um, but I, I would agree that Anakin becomes much more likable. Yeah, Obi Wan's always been fairly likable, right? Especially with James. And what? Yeah, and uh, and what I love about Obi Wan in this is I really start to see not start I see him not just as a likable Jedi but as a leader, and uh, and both through uh, mentoring Anakin but as well as leading a clone army. But yeah, I, I would totally agree that the Clone Wars is what made me like like Anakin because you see I, I feel like I see his growth more in the Clone Wars than I did in the films um, yeah hmm. well so then we get to the very end we, he breaks in and then we get to actually find out that it was it is Echo yes and he's got the, he's in this like frozen zombie like his, mm. his face is gray and ashen and he looks like he's half dead, but it, apparently he's not. We have to figure out a way to get him out of that machine, and, it, and it's very kind of jarring. In fact, you kind of let this audible 
grown out when you saw what he looked like. Yeah, it looked very dire. Uh, and I thought he looked very plastic, um, like he hadn't moved in, in you know, a long time. And they've got him connected. All I could think was, um, well, I, I, what, I, what I was thinking when I saw him, and when he falls out and he's got those wires attached to around his head, I thought about SIBO from Rebels. Oh, yeah. And uh, and that episode in Rebels where you see all this of This might those, be where that tech comes from. I, I wondered. And we see that episode where there are m- multiple uh, cre- beings that are being manipulated by the Empire. And so I wonder, you know, is that technology from the Techno Union um, the, uh, of, of brainwashing or com- controlling people? And so, yeah, he just falls out. And like you said, he was in a very zombie state. And that's when I made the groan because I thought, maybe he's not really there. But after he, he sets him, Rex brings him down and sets him on the floor. And he, and, he, and he says, Echo, Echo. Echo sort of comes to and says, where? And he looks around like he's seeing the place for the very first time. And he says, where am I? And then you realize they've got, they've, they've, they're, they're going to rescue this guy. Yeah, because he mentions the Citadel. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, and, he, yeah. and he mentions these things, so he's not in a in a in a semi comatose vegetative state, mm-hmm. but in fact um, was just. I mean, think about how horribly invasive and, and frightening that is that he would be captured like this and forced against his will to betray all of his brothers in the Clone Wars army, and how he has. Uh, t- taken away complete agency in any initiative or. or or foresight on his part that he has to do these things. I mean, that's a pretty unique form of torture. Absolutely. And one thing that came to mind uh, as I was watching last night is, yes, we know that we know that they're drawing out of his memory battle tactics. But I wonder what else what else Echo would know. I mean, I, he you know being being a clone trooper probably doesn't know tons of secrets of the right. Republic. But certainly, he he would be know and be aware of locations of bases, and um, again, the battle tactics, or even if there was any sort of you know new weaponry or something like that, military wise, what other kind of information they might have drawn from uh, Echo, and that we might see, uh, you know, bite them in the or, or uh, stab them in the back in the future. Yeah, no, I agree, and so then you get a kind of a sense of warmth at the end in a way because he's with his friend. But it's also interesting that there's two episodes left of this arc. So there's oh, two more. Yeah, right? this, this is the second of four episodes, I'm pretty sure. And you just can't help but wonder where are they going to go with this thing? And it, will the Bad Batch, you know, you just wonder where they are at the time of Order 66. Because I feel like they would be pretty dangerous to the Jedi if they were... If they that chip was not removed, but maybe they don't have the chip. I don't know. Hmm. Hadn't really thought of that, other than what what jumped into my mind when you said there are two more episodes to this story arc. I mean, that's first of all, that's one third of. I know. That's one of third the of the uh, I know. of the, sh- of the and season. And you would assume the Siege of Mandalore is four. I would think, and then Ahsoka. Yeah, and who knows how long? Maybe somehow, that one won't be. Maybe there's a couple of two parters. Maybe, but what I thought of when you said that was more bad batch. I know. I, at least that's great. what I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the armor, we, we talked about the armor a little bit the last time we yeah. reviewed Clone Wars, but I definitely think we need, like, if they made a black series of these four, I think I would actually open these. That, <laughs> that, would, be, that would be awesome. And the funny thing is, I did not feel this way about the Bad Batch after one episode. I, I thought they were cool, but we, you had mentioned, or someone had mentioned, you know, we need we need uh, an action figure of these guys. And I, yeah. I, 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 while I'm always up for new action figures uh, to to show, you know, our our love of Star Wars, it didn't really strike me as something that I, I needed to have. But after the second episode and all the things we've talked about regarding the Bad Batch, I'm with you. If this was a Black Series four part figure set, oh, I'm in. It would be very, very cool. Anything you want to say about the episode before we wrap up? Because I think we've covered a, a, a lot of the stuff. It's, I don't think there's as much to dissect in this one as there was the first one. And that's I'm, not a bad thing. It's just there. No. I mean, you, ha- you have to rescue Echo. Right. And, and I will say this. I, I was pleased with the outcome of this. Um, I, I, kind of, I kind of felt like I was, we were going to have a disappointing ending to this one. And that he was going to be... Irre- irretrievable 
um, when when they saw him. And I think that's why I made that that uh, nonverbal groan when when he fell out because I thought, oh, he's not like I really thought he was going to be just there in body and and more controlled and not able to revive. And so I'm glad for that. I was telling you before the show that I have a student that uh, that I talk Clone Wars with quite a bit. And I got an email from him after the episode one saying, Echo is alive. And I wanted to, and I wanted to be like, oh, we don't know that yet. <laughs> I love it. But he was, he was super excited. He, is a, he loves the clones uh, more than anybody I know. And so his joy that, of the possibility of Echo being around, was, it was there. And so I guess if I were to say something, just a, a final comment on this, I'm, I'm really pleased with the outcome of, of this. And, and go Rex, following that intuition. Well, okay, so at the beginning of the episode, you gave this one a B plus. Uh, do you still feel the same way? I'm going to stay there, and here's why. Um, I thought it was, a, it was a solid episode, just like episode one. But I'm sticking with the B plus because I'm just, I'm going with what I'm anticipating the rest of the season to go, you know, the rest of the series to go. This, the, now that I know that there's four in this, I, I, I'm hoping for growth. And it's not because I'm disappointed by any means. I thought these were two great starting episodes. And maybe at the end, when we were sitting and talking about episode 12, I might go back and say, I'm going to bump up those first two because of what they did for the whole series. Fair enough. I, and I, I, what I say? Did I say a B plus or a B? a B plus as well, yeah. Okay, I, I think I'm going to make it a B. Okay. Yeah. Just because, I, I mean, I think it's good. I think it's more of a, a setup than actually, um, you know, and I don't know. I just think I think it's a B. I think I mean it's a middle solid. episode of a four yeah. four story arc. So exactly. I thought it, it did exactly what with it some, needed with to. Some key points, some interesting, uh, thought provoking ideas. I absolutely love what they did with the idea of culture and, and indigenous people and respecting a language that's not your language, and and understanding you have to meet someone where they are at, and it doesn't mean that they are less than you. It's just they are different than you. Yeah, and you have to learn from their point of view. And I think that is a wonderful thing that I want my kids to know, Mm -hmm. for sure. You know, something we didn't really talk about is talking about the respect of culture and indigenous peoples. When they rushed into the camp of the Poltecs, they were firing. And my my instant reaction to that was, ooh, I cringed a little bit. And then I realized that they were just disarming the Poltecs. Right. And they weren't shooting at the Poltecs. It can't help, but it made me think about um, the time of the Native Americans, really. Hmm. You know, and like they're invading their land, sure, and they're offering to help. You know, the the people who are in the land who's or is being invaded are offering to help. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Just made good me point. Th- made me yeah, think of that. Point. There's a lot of real world parallels, uh, in especially in the Clone Wars. I think that a lot of people have really uh, gravitated toward. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are the podcast you're looking for. This is. <laughs> That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a cup of coffee with me and for helping to spread the word about our Star Wars family we've got here at Coffee with Kenobi. To join us in the CWK Cafe, which is our Facebook group, and share your Star Wars thoughts, comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler-free place that is also drama-free, go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and be part of the conversation talk about this week's show, or just talk some Star Wars. It is a lot of fun, and you'll make some new friends, as well as catch up with longtime friends there as well. I also want to thank all of our new and longtime members of the CWK family and let you know how much I appreciate your help and support. I love being able to give back to you with CWK Pour Over, the exclusive weekly podcast not heard anywhere else. I want to thank our CWK family members, Jason Hall, Dennis Keithley, Colby Mead, Jessica Berry, Adam Bankhurst, David Nicely, Jeff Ellis, Ross Hallivan, Frank Mulder, Alexander Moylan, Aaron Harris, Chris Gavarka, Angela Sauce, Susan Gray, Connie Shee, Tyler Pompey, Hannah, Alex Procasio, Ian Thompson, Simbot Defterdarian, Christine Turk, Kurt McKellen, Dan Ream, Brian Harding, Blake Weaver, Jim Capron, Caroline Maselli, Chris Metz, LJ Souter, Thea Selby, Daz Davies, Christian Dale, Brian McKinney, Jared Cantor, BJ Smith, Eric Struthers, Nick Deco, and Mark Suter. 
If you want to be an exclusive member of our CWK family, go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash support. It's a great way to help support and help out the show, and 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to support the incredibly important work they are doing to help these brave children and their families. In addition to being a part of the community on Facebook, please don't forget to visit our website at www.coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, videos, and so much more. If you have a question for me or just want to share your thoughts on the air, feel free to email me at danzy at coffeewithkenobi.com and I'll share them on the show. You can also connect with me on Twitter at Mr. Zer, M-R-Z-E-H-R. There are also a lot more ways to connect with me and Coffee with Kenobi on social media. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Give us a like on Facebook at facebook.com slash coffee with Kenobi and check us out on Pinterest. You can find me twice a month on the podcast Looking at Lucasfilm, part of the Jim Hill Media Podcast Network, and you can find my writing on CWK's website as well as StarWars.com and on IGN. And if you are considering starting a podcast or a blog, let me know how I can help you get started and help you make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out DanzyMedia.com and we can get the process started. I am also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. I want to inspire you to be inspired. Don't be afraid to take that first step into a larger world. Thanks, as always, to our CWK sponsors, especially MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, our travel partner, and your one-stop shop for all things Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or anywhere on the planet that you want to go on vacation. Please go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel to book your magical vacation and help support Coffee with Kenobi in the process. If you like the show, please tweet out that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your friends and family to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. And if the force is especially with you, please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Google Podcasts. Every review makes a huge difference and helps spread the word. So I think that's probably going to do it for this week's Coffee with Kenobi. Thanks so much, everybody, for, uh, of course, for listening and for giving us your feedback. Again, be sure to vote on that poll for who is your favorite clone in the Bad Batch. Go Tech. Yeah, no uh, no, uh, fair... Preaching to your constituents there, buddy. (laughs) Very good. Well, uh, have a great week, everybody. Until next time, this is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Move along. Move along. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Try listening to them on audio, featuring sound effects and music directly from the movies. Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. With stories from your favorite Star Wars movies, television shows, and comics, you'll have plenty to keep you entertained. Start listening now wherever audiobooks are sold.